Welcome to Conversations, Season 2 of the MTA Podcast Series, a weekly audio cast featuring interviews with leading investment strategists, geopolitical experts, and other key thought leaders. Brought to you by the Market Technicians Association and your host, Ed Carlson. You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to have an IQ of 150. If you just keep playing the game long enough, you'll be in the right spot at the time, just enough times. Just don't go making big mistakes. I have made every mistake in the book, have suffered through many sleepless nights, and have had conversations with higher powers that be. Through it all, I have never wanted to leave the trading business. I don't love trading, and I don't hate it. It's just what I do. I love working. Tuesday, December 14th, 2010, this is Conversations, the official MTA podcast series. And this week's guest is Linda Rashke. Linda Bradford Rashke is president of LBR Group, a registered CTA and money management firm and president of LBR Asset Management. She began her professional trading career in 1981 as a market maker in equity options. In addition to running LBR Group's CTA program, she is the principal trader for the Granat Fund. She was recently ranked 18th out of 4,020 CTAs for best five years performance by Barclays Capital. Ms. Rashke was recognized in Jack Schwager's critically acclaimed book, the own top selling book, Street Smart's High Probability Short Term Trading Strategies. She has served on the board of the directors for the Market Technicians Association and is a past president of the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts. Ms. Rashke has presented her research and lectured on trading for the Managed Futures Association, American Association of Professional Technical Analysts, Bloomberg, International Federation of Technical Analysis, Canadian Society of Technical Analysts, International Online Trading Expo, and has lectured in over 16 different countries for Dow Jones Tellerate. And she is a mom. Linda Rashke, welcome to the program. Hi, Ed. <laughs> Thanks for having me here. I don't know what to say after that introduction. <laughs> oh, no, that's a great bio. It really is. That, uh, that's got some gravitas to it. Listen, it's thank helpful. you for taking the time to uh, join us. I know it's it's getting late in Chicago, and it's getting cold in Chicago as well as New York. Poor Shane, uh, you guys are both uh, wearing your earmuffs today. Uh, j- just out of curiosity, how old is your, are your child or ch- children or child? <laughs> My one child is turning 22 tomorrow. 22, wow. You trying okay. to date me on the show here, Ed, oh, huh? Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Date me, age me. Okay, yes, oh, age my. me. All right. Goodness, okay. Um, Linda, what did you... This is what uh, happens at the end of an FOMC meeting, you do realize. What's that? Yes, tripping up over words. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, yeah, right, 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 right. Uh, Linda, let's get started by, why don't you uh, tell us, give, give us a little uh, uh, history. What, tell us where you grew up, where you went to school, um, you know, just some background pre-technical analysis. Yeah, I grew up in California and went to school out there, and that's how I ended up uh, wor- working in San Francisco, right across the street from the Pacific Coast Stock Exchange. So, uh uh, uh, that's, you know, when, when I made it down to the trading floor, there wasn't a whole lot of awareness about the trading floors, and um, it was only through meeting somebody else that was a market maker in the options uh, that, that I got the opportunity to be back to, to be a trader down there. Um, well, now, wait a minute. But, I'm uh, going to jump in here. Lena, I'll bet there's an awful lot of people that are out there listening right now that are saying, yeah, but how did you make it to the floor of the Pacific Coast Stock Exchange? You know, it was just one of those things where I had um, uh, a friend that I used to play tennis with was a market maker down there on the floor, and he was explaining to my roommate pricing options, and I thought, well, gee, you know, I could do that. And I had had a little bit of uh, background with the markets in my senior year in college. I was on the board of a fund called the Charles R. Blythe Fund, which was set up. Um, they had one at Stanford and one at uh, Occidental College, and it was where 12 students were chosen to basically uh, make the investment decisions for a fund throughout the year, and this was in 1979. Of course, a lovely bear market it wasn't the most exciting time to be doing that, but it was still an education process, you know, with the tools and resources out there. So when I originally moved to San Francisco, I did it with the intent of being a stockbroker, And, of course, you know, everybody laughs at you when you're 21 years old and you go to San Francisco to be a stockbroker. So that uh, got put by the wayside pretty quickly there, and I took a nice, boring accounting job at, uh, actually, as a financial analyst at Crown Zellerbach, which their offices were right across the street from the exchange, coincidentally. 
So it's just one of those circuitous routes, you know, and you kind of end up where you're meant to to be. Um, with that said, you know, it's it's still a learning experience being on the trading floor. And my learning experience, you know, I uh, got caught in a takeover uh, situation fairly early in my career, which took me about five years then to pay off. Um, there was a great business library in San Francisco that had one of the largest collections of technical analysis books. So I used to go there, and I remember checking out books like uh, uh, Equivolume, you know, by Richard mm-hmm. Arms, and right. you know things on uh, oh my goodness, uh, I don't know, chaos theory, and you know, catastrophe theory, and all kinds of interesting things that were. Just good academic exercises, you know, but in the, the practical realities of trading on the floor were that, you know, uh, more, more concerned with volume and order flow and, uh, lots of scrambling at times. So, uh, the, the process of, of learning technical analysis was really a, an evolution over a good, good 10 year period. Okay. All right. Before we get away from this, so real quickly, uh, what did you major in in school? <laughs> I was actually a double major with music and uh, economics. So really fascinating. Yes. What's your uh, what's your uh, your your major in, in music? What you what you do? Uh, music composition, actually. Okay. I was a pianist, so I you know uh, did that since I was a little kid. I, I, I've sworn to listeners that I will never uh, go into that topic again. We've done that with so many people in the past. It's just amazing how many uh, technicians have backgrounds in the arts. Um, okay, mm. so um, usually I would be asking at this point, well, how did you transition to technical analysis? But I guess you just did it through uh, bootstrapping, huh? You just started reading and you were already trading. Um, well, you know what some... happens is like when you're on the trading floor, you see what other traders are doing. And um, we used to all get these charts. Uh, Security Market Research was the publisher of them. And, you know, at the time, you'd call up on a hotline at night and you'd plot a little oscillator. So we didn't have computers and software applications back in those days. And we maintained charts by hand. And so I, uh, the person that originally backed me used to do this. So I fell into doing that as well. And then... Um, he also kept the things like a 10-day moving average of the advanced declines, the put-call ratios, up volume, down volume. So I started doing this pretty much from day one. And uh, the main thing is just to be aware of the um, very overbought or very oversold uh, conditions, you know, perhaps uh, 10-day moving averages of the trend and the put-call ratios. And you start to see these market extremes and the understand that the volatility is greater at those extremes, you know, um, the market doesn't turn on a dime in those cases, but, you know, they're just representing opportunity. So that's very much how I uh, grew up trading, you know, waiting for these extremes with the overbought conditions and the advanced decline and the sentiment indicators and, and the trend and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And then it was kind of interesting because I remember there was a period there, it was like in 1986, uh, no, actually it was the summer of 1987, I can tell you like from March, April, and it, was, it started May and June and July in 86, and the market just started creeping, you know, just doing these one of those like inching, inching, inching higher, and, and at that point, you know, I sort of felt lost, it had lost some of its volatility, it was just a steady, methodical grind, and and it dawned on me, you know, in the middle of, the, of, of one afternoon, I'm like, wow, I have absolutely no idea, you know, what I'm doing here, <laughs> <You know, laughs> after trading for a while, you know, but it was like how to get a handle on the market, how to frame it out in, in terms of a of a logical structure and framework, you know, because I was just very used to you know, you're uh, more of a range type of trading environment and, and mm. plays and volatility and, uh, you know, e- easy, recognizable sentiment extremes. And then the market just st- started this a steady grinding trend. And um, so at that point, you know, I, I, I realized that, that, that I needed to learn a few more tools and stuff. And, you know, uh, it's just always a gradual awareness. You know, there's never a set point, you know, mm-hmm. or an aha moment. And and then it was kind of fun because I had a friend uh, that I used to go up to the, um, oh gosh, where was it? 
I don't know. At, at some point, I had, I had a friend, and we decided that we were going to get. He asked if I wanted to get my CMT, you know, with him. Yeah, mm. uh, uh, yeah, for the MTA. And I'm like, oh, geez, you know, okay, sure, whatever. You know, I've been Why training not? for 15 years. You know, big deal, right? <laughs> uh, but yeah. actually, you know, it forces you to study in a more organized, formal fashion. And um, you know, in terms of all of a sudden nailing down the classic technical analysis, like what is the classic definition of a trend? If you ask people, how do you define a trend, you know, a lot of people give answers like, uh, you know, moving averages or, you know, the market's making, you know, highs or, you know, 20-day highs or whatever the case may be. And the, the true classic definition is higher highs and higher lows, and you usually have to have, according to Wyckoff, um, two higher lows, you know, to establish then that you've got some degree of trend. You know, it's not just a higher higher and higher low, because that could be a zigzag pattern, right? Mm. So just all these little uh, basic nuances, you know, what is the real definition of support, you know, two data points, you know, and two data points, and, you know, how how you would um, draw trend lines on classic chart formations. And, again, they're all just structures, you know, structures that provide a model to trade around, and there's a lot of gray area around the edges of these points, you know, but you need some consistent way of organizing data. And so to me, that's what technical analysis has really provided is a consistent framework for organizing data. And of course, there's subgroups within that. Some people choose, you know, to organize the data around like the waves, you know, Elliott wave fashion. Some people use use time components. Some people use, you know, classic chart formations. There's lots of different constructs within that. So in that regards, I find there's also flexibility with, uh, you know, with the discipline that you can choose your methodology, how you're going to organize the data, you know, from point and figure charting to market profile, et cetera. But there's many different tools that one can draw from, you know, and that's, that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Pretty cool. <laughs> you know, Linda, you've written quite a bit uh, or talk, spoken quite a bit about trader psychology, and as sort of a segue into that, I, I wanted to use one of those quotes I read from our introduction. I have made every mistake in the book, have suffered through many sleepless nights, and have had conversations with the higher powers that be. Through it all, <laughs> I have never wanted to leave the trading business. I don't love trading, and I don't hate it. It's just what I do. I love working. You know, I, I love that quote. It, it shows a level of modesty and personal insight, uh, either of which is unusual to find in a person these days, but to find that combination in one person is exceedingly rare. Before we move into trading psychology, can you add anything else to that quote? I mean, for example, tell the truth. Do you suppose these two qualities might be the key to your success? Well, I think that a big part of trading and uh, as, as a technical analysis, of course, is uh Recognizing that prices are driven by fear and greed, and naturally we don't want those creeping into our own decision-making process. So, enemy, uh, you know, emotions are going to be the enemy of the decision-making process for a trader. So that's number one in your your trader psychology is that you have to find that base where you can practice good, consistent decision making, um, you know, not be up te- up- uptight and anxious or upset or emotional or whatever, have a logical plan. And I think a lot of that comes with experience. You know, the more you trade, the less emotional you get. But back to technical analysis, that is one of the uh, ways that you can harness technical analysis, you know, and, and tools. It- you know, putting things in a quantitative framework or some type of structure where instead of being fearful of at bottoms, you study and you you uh, organize the data so, so, so that you have certain indicators and signs that this is a market bottom and it takes the emotions out of the process or at least it will alleviate them. So I think that that is a very... Um, a very key element to trader psychology is having control over those emotions, uh, you know, and um, certainly that's why I, I see the people that have been experienced in the markets for many years tradings, they're not going to do well when they're going through divorce or, you know, IRS audits or moving or very disruptive things. Uh-huh, so uh-huh. It's, it, with that regard, it's very much a performance-oriented discipline, and uh, all the things that you would need to perform well on a tennis court, uh, consistency, level-headedness, so forth, are going to be applicable in the markets, too. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. I think well, you know, and, and and again, just to give people hope out there, <laughs> you know, <laughs> when you're when you're a newer trader or newer to the business, it's natural to feel more emotions. Just understand that it's natural to feel a little nervous or a little anxious or a little hesitant. You know, um, but just recognize that over time, you know, the more that you observe things and the more that you study them, and this is the importance of doing your own research. You know, you start to get a little thicker skin and a little bit more confidence, and it's it's all a, a process. Mm-hmm. You have said a positive mental attitude is a form of religion to me, and you you've advised people to read sports psychology books. Now, how far do you take this? Is this uh, Stuart Smalley? I'm good enough. I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. Or, or are we talking about something else here? Well, you know, one of the things about the business is is that you're a little bit of a loner. You have to become your own best cheerleader, if you will. You know, it's not like you have a boss that's motivating you per se. You have to dig internally and motivate yourself and find your own sources of inspiration. And I I, I truly believe that the thoughts that we put in our head will find a way to manifest themselves. And obviously, there's been a lot more awareness and and, uh, literature and movies and so forth that you know, put out this idea, but you know, I always uh, keep those books like you know Napoleon Hill and you know Norman Vincent Peale and you know all these classic Og Mandino, all these wonderful gems out there. You know, I own them all because you know so many times where there's challenges in our life, you just pick up one book and, and open it randomly and read a paragraph, you know, and it uh, it jolts the brain like, hey, you know, let's make sure that we're steering down the right road in life. And, um, you know, part of that is um, at least my mom was a good example, you know. She always said, used to say, okay, you can see the glass half full or half empty, you know, make lemons out of, lemonade out of lemons and, and so forth and so forth. And, you know, life is like that. So we're all dealt different hands in life and, you know, have challenges to overcome. And certainly the market is going to present more challenges than anything. So it's, you know, it's how you go about dealing with those. Yeah, yeah. Some people look at the glass as half full. Some people look at it as, as half empty. And you and I say, why not put some scotch in it? Um, <laughs> well, you know, the other thing to understand when when trading and following the markets is that the amount of patience that it takes. You know, not every day is going to be a winner. Not every week is going to be a winner. And you, if, if you understand the law of numbers in the market, it's a very uneven distribution. So, for example, when I'm managing money and I have my hedge fund, I know that maybe three months of the year are probably going to make up 80% of my earnings, even though I, I'm not necessarily a trend follower per se, but there's just times where there's more volatility in the markets. So you need to have a longer time horizon, and you need to have a bit more patience, and, and sometimes it's frustrating, you know, those slower periods or summer months, um, you, you can't force the hand and you can't force the play. You just have to wait and wait for your opportunity. So I think that, you know, if you have a positive attitude in life in general, it will help you ride out those slower times because it's a very cyclical business. Mm-hmm. Linda, we are already down to our last three minutes, and I had so much here I wanted to talk about uh, trader psychology, but there's one one item I, I can't let go. Uh, just last week, I added to my uh, template of questions uh, to start. I wanted to start asking guests, how do you relax? And, and from what I've read about you, this is actually a very important part of your um, your routine. Um, talk to us about uh, getting away from the markets and relaxing. <laughs> I relax because I go to the gym and I lift weights. <laughs> That's my idea of relaxing these days. It's called find a way to get rid of your stress. That's mm-hmm. really what it's about. And I think I think that you need to do something physical or out there with nature or gardening or walking or, or tennis or have some exercise, you know, to get the blood going to the brain and oxygen. And I, th- I think that's really important. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So now we're we're kind of in a wrap up mode already. I told you this is going to go fast. Um, I, I've got to ask you these questions. First of all, who would you say have been your greatest influences, and do you have any favorite books you'd like to recommend to people? 
Oh, wow. If you went onto my website, um, ldrgroup.com, I've got a recommended reading list on there, everything from all the motivational books and positive thinking books to my favorite technical books. So that's a resource right there because there's so many uh, great books that were written, especially the books from 80 years ago and 100 years ago. I love all that old classic stuff. Uh, Schaubacher and just all kinds of great pearly words of wisdom there. And in terms of, uh, <laughs> yeah, Schaubacher, Wyckoff, you know, my old heroes there. Uh-huh. Uh, in, terms, in terms of, let's see, reading, what was your other question? Um, uh, greatest influences. Oh, boy, greatest influences. Ah, hmm. I think you, you know, just gave them to me. Yeah, That's all right. yeah. That's fine. Yeah, listen, okay, so uh, believe it or not, we actually do try and talk a little bit about the markets around here. Um, I always ask, what are your thoughts on the markets for the weeks ahead? But after reading a lot of your material, uh, I've kind of come to the conclusion you don't really care about the weeks ahead. You're You're more interested in the minutes and hours. Is that correct? Uh, you know, not so much the minutes, but you know, I just think that you have to um, always leave yourself uh, flexible. You know, because um, any time I I try and project, uh, you know, anything from fundamentals or uh, you know my own personal biases, which of course we all have. Um, mm-hmm. It, 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 the longer out that goes, the less likely that I'm 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 going to be correct. That that's pretty much what happens is your ability to predict drops off. You know, as the time horizon is extended, and uh, you know you can have uh, simply a, a good liquidation flush. You know, where the market gets overweighted and you have a good washout. You know, on uh-huh. it could even be a news-driven event, and that might create opportunity to the upside. You know, even though you might macro picture be bearish. So I do think that uh, a good part of Trading is recognizing that it is exactly that. It's trading. It's not long-term investing, and there's a big difference there. Mm -hmm. Well, we've only got, what, uh, two, two and a half weeks left in this year. Would you care to venture a guess on what uh, we're looking at for the remainder of the year? Um, I think that right now I'm just seeing a lot of people had such a splendid September and October uh, and, and even the part into November run there. I mean, you just had these uh, amazing large standard deviation moves in, in the metals and silver and gold and, you know, a, a lot of commodities, you know, copper, cotton, just we made new historic prices in a lot of markets. That's pretty significant. I don't think there's been so many new historic uh, price levels as I've seen uh, in, in uh, the end of third quarter and fourth quarter, you know, this year, I, I, that's a pretty strong indication right there that, you know, you've got major trends still in force. But I, I do see a lot of uh, money coming off the table here and people sort of cashing in their chips just because they had such a, a good run. So uh, I think it's going to be a little bit choppy. Mm, okay. Linda, it's been great having you with us today. We appreciate you taking the time. Is there anything else you'd like to mention before we go? No, just that it's such an honor to to, to do this for the MTA, and and it had such a profound influence on me for many years, and it's a a tremendous organization that's grown in so many ways, and uh, I hope you have me back as a guest sometime. (laughs) <laughs> well, thank you for volunteering. I, I think we will. Today's guest has been Linda Rashke. And this is our last podcast of 2010. Shane and I want to wish everyone a happy holiday and a very happy new year. And that wraps up this week's MTA podcast. From Seattle Technical Advisors, I'm Ed Carlson, together with our recording engineer, Shane Squark in New York City. Shane, if we can hear you, say goodbye. We'll see you in January, everybody. <laughs> okay. Let's keep our stops tight. Good day.